Hello and welcome to the brand new BAC podcast, the official podcast of Briggs Automotive Company. My name is Stuart Newman and I'm joined by company founders Neil Briggs. Hi everyone. And Ian Briggs. Hello everyone. Who are going to let you behind the scenes of the world famous mono supercar to explore what it's really like to run a successful supercar business. Now, I guess despite our best efforts to help you listeners out there who don't know an awful lot about the Mono, so allow me to fill you in. So Mono became the world's first single-seater road legal supercar when it was launched at the 2011 Retro Classics in Stuttgart. It's known for offering a show-stopping design, cutting-edge engineering and technology, and is just about the closest thing you can get to a Formula experience on the road. Its sheer focus is providing the ultimate driving experience and celebrating driving in its purest form. Every single mono is completely one of a kind and fully tailored to the owner. And the car itself has been exported to over 40 countries worldwide and broken 12 production car lap records at renowned circuits across the globe. Neil and Ian alongside me are the two brothers responsible for it all. Now, 2021 marks the 10 year anniversary of the launch of the BAC Mono. And over the next 10 episodes, we'll be discussing all the remarkable and occasionally hysterical things that have happened in the past decade. From the iconic Top Gear shoot with Jeremy Clarkson to meeting the Queen of England, breaking records around the world and every little thing in between, whatever that may be. So I've worked with Neil and Ian Briggs for a number of years now, and this has largely come about because the two just descend into the most insightful and hilarious stories whenever they're together. And those stories are just far too good not to share. So here we are, the BAC podcast. Episode one, boys, are you both ready? I am. I don't know if Ian is. Yeah, no, I am, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm a bit nervous that the stories might not be funny enough to keep up with the uh, to keep up with the introduction, but we'll give it a go. <laughs> okay, let's do it. So today, this very day, as we're talking right now, marks ten years exactly since you first launched the BAC Mono in Stuttgart. Never felt older, I'm sure, but first and foremost. Happy anniversary, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks for that, Stuart. It's um, it's funny that the, the 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 day we launched the car is not the day that I always have in my mind. It's the day we started the project, actually, which was even longer ago. Because that makes me feel <laughs> makes me feel even older. But uh, it is it is a milestone, and uh, uh, it's something we perhaps didn't we didn't look this far ahead. I don't think at the start. I don't know about you, Neil. Did you? Yeah, uh, I mean, um, first of all, ten years. God, it's. Um, it is. It does feel like a lifetime. Um, you know, life life goes so very very quickly these days, and 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 it's easy for months to become a year, and, and years to become two, three, four years. And uh, but ten years, it does actually feel like a significant a significant time frame. Um, I certainly feel a lot more refreshed, uh, <laughs> brighter than I did t- this day ten years ago, having driven uh, all the way through the night. Uh, to get the car on the uh, to get the car on the stand, just literally in time for the doors to open and uh, the VIP press to be invited in. But no, I went, the way the project started wasn't really a um, a significant uh, starting point for me. Um, it wasn't a, a, a time in space where we said, right, p- p- pens up, let's start, let's start doing this. Because of course, it, it, we'd been thinking about it for well over ten years prior to that. It was almost like the culmination of of all the chatting that we'd done um, of now we're going to make a start on this and we're going to actually, you know, we're going to start creating something as opposed to talking about something. So I can see why it was significant for Ian because, you know, it was, it was pens up at that point. Um, But no, it's just, just great to be in talking about it actually and having the time to be able to, to, to ponder the memories of, of where we've been. I think for me, the, 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 the day, I mean, there was the day that you and I, we were driving home, uh, and we'll have to, obviously have to explain some of our background, how we ended up at that point. But we were driving home from a, a customer uh, meeting and we decided we were talking about how we could do it. And Neil had come up with an idea how we thought we could make it work. And we said, yeah, let's do it. And he said, well, we need to get someone on the project. And all of our staff at that time were, were busy doing paid projects. Um, and so I started to, to look for someone. I got a, a young lad straight out of university, just done a master's degree in transportation design, Murray Adams, who's still with us. I'm sure there's, there's plenty of funny stories about him to come. But the, the day he sat next to me in our office and we, and we gave him his first brief to start doing some market research and things, that was, that was a significant day. 
um, for me. Of course, the launch was as well. Of course, but but I always think of I always think of being almost fifteen years in rather than being ten mm. years in. Let's talk. Let's talk about launch for a sec. So obviously, I mean, it, it helps that your both your memories about BAC are absolutely phenomenal. Um, so let's go behind the scenes of that launch a little bit. Tell us what happened that day in 2011. I guess the the build up to the cover off moment must have been just unbelievable. And as you say, years in the making. Well, well, we'd we'd been we'd been building the car in the UK and through a connection that we had uh, here in Stuttgart. Um, we'd had the opportunity to show the car at the Retro Classics 2011 in in, in March, obviously. Um, long story short, I flew here the day before. Neil and um, Guy set off in the truck. They drove through the night, as Neil had intimated. Um, and I waited, bated breath all through the night to make sure they were going to make it. Um, we'd bought the truck online. We'd met the guy selling it the night before at the NEC. He'd driven up from London. We'd driven down. Neil had already paid him <laughs> before we set off. Um, so we were worried the whole time whether he was going to show up. He, he'd give us the truck. It looked all, all okay in the dark. Um, and then he obviously drove all the way back to London, hoping the money really was there in his bank account when he got back, <laughs> which it was, of course. So that was, the, that was the first hurdle. And then we had no idea how reliable this truck was going to be. So I, I, didn't, I hardly slept at all, although we'd been working through the night on and off for weeks. I hardly slept a wink and I kept looking at my phone to see if they'd called SMS and all the rest of it. Nothing. Tried calling and both phones went straight to mailbox. So I was terrified. Uh, I thought the <laughs> trucks broke down, the batteries are flat, trying to ring for help. Um, you know, so that's how the day started for me. Um, Neil obviously drove all the way through the night. Um, but then I got a call about six o'clock in the morning Um but we're nearly there. So I had, I had some friends because we we're going to have to manhandle the car off the truck. It wasn't, we didn't have anything flash with lifts and all the rest of it. So I needed lots of bodies to help. So they were all on standby. So they all got a call early in the morning. We met the truck up at the show, uh, got the car off, wheeled it in. And there were still things to do. Um, Guy Harvey, another one of our designers, who I'm sure that we'll have plenty of funny stories about. He um, he was doing the, the graphics for the steering wheel. Um, Neil was that cleaning stuff. We were just getting everything ready. And about an hour before the opening, I ran home to get put a suit on. And as I came back, they were just putting the final little details to it. And at two o'clock, when the, when the official press uh, viewing opened, Neil and Guy went out of door left. Um, I stepped up onto the stage and, and we were off, you know. As, as Ian said, that literally we'd been looking for, 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 for some transportation and... Um... Uh, we were dreaming about buying some ex, uh, ex Mercedes Formula One truck and having all these brilliant things. The reality was this thing cost us three and a half grand. Uh, and um, yeah, we, we picked it up the day before, drove back, um, kicked the tires, made sure it was, it was going to you know, do the job. And uh, we loaded the car. Uh, we had a few things to pick up on the way down there, like some of the ancillaries for the stand and things that, that, that set us back a little bit. Uh, Guy and myself were sharing the driving, um, so lots to talk about and, and ponder. Um, and, and Guy Ian and myself go back, you know, nearly thirty years actually to, to university days and, and, and beyond. Uh, so there's, there's so many things to talk about and reflect. And of course, a, a twenty hour journey then doesn't seem that long. Um, and we turned up there um, on time. Um, in fact, we were slightly early, uh, and, and, and everything's just a continuation of, of the journey you'd, you'd been on for the six months prior to that of, of designing parts, but then procuring parts and assembling the car. Um, and it was just, it was, it was right down to the wire. And then of course, when all these people moved in, um, uh, we moved off Ian came in, uh, and then I don't think we saw Guy for about a week after that because I think he he went and got grabbed a drink on one of the, the stands that was in the exhibition and he had a few more drinks and a few more drinks and then we literally didn't see him for a week. He he uh, did not slept for weeks. Um, and uh, for me, I got changed into some slightly smarter clothes, uh, blended into the background. My German is is fairly reasonable. It's not it's not as 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 honed as Ian is, having lived there for the time that he has and he was doing the vast majority of the talking. So I was kind of trying to take it all in and enjoying it at the same time, but fighting a bit of exhaustion. And, um, but it was, it was hugely, uh, you know, it was a huge, hugely proud moment for us. And I think one of the big key things for me was uh, 
there were some journalists that walked in. Uh, and up until this point, the car had been either a rendering or it had been a project that we'd been able to spend significant time with people explaining what the car was all about, you know, mm. that it was this car that had this singularity of purpose and therefore it was a single seat and therefore it followed the formula style of, of layout and, and, and the aesthetic and all these different things. But when you take a cover off something and people then make up their own opinion of it, it's, it's living proof really based on, on, on the reaction of uh, of whether or not you've you've got it right or you've got it wrong and the reaction was 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 you know obviously the car looks incredible and it's it's a stunning thing to look at um and that was the first thing that grabbed people's attention and then of course the engineering details and the more they learned about the car that it was it was clear that that the singularity of purpose was was absolutely clear to the audience not just the people from within our organization and and that's when we kind of looked at each other and sort of thought, right, we've we've got this right, really. Um, and, did you anticipate and the, that? Did you think, you know, before you were there, did you get there and think, okay, people are going to love this? Or did you, were you just, you know, terrified they may not? I think you're terrified, but uh, it's some, certainly in the back of your mind. As Neil said, you've, you've had a chance to present it to anyone who's ever seen it. This is what it's about. This is what it's for. This is why it looks this way. And then when you show it, it's like, oh, that all makes sense because you've just walked them through the process you went through. Whereas as Neil says, when you pull the cover off, they're just going to form an opinion. First is, are they going to understand what it's even for, what it's about? And I, I remember exactly the moment when we looked at each other, a, a journalist walked up with the photographer and the journalist turned to the photographer and said, this is what the KTM crossbow should have been. So it's like, <laughs> I, I get goosebumps now when I say it because he got he knew exactly what kind of a product it was, what it was about, and he, and he saw that, that it was focused and... And a, and a good solution, you know. And so that, that, that was a, there was a slight sigh of relief. I was like, oh, okay, people understand it, people get it. And as the day went on, it became clear that the people not, knew it and knew what it was for, so. Sure, did you think at the time, like, you know, this is gonna be as big as it was, or do you, you know, you still pinch yourself now thinking, wow, this, this really took off, like, you know, nothing we could ever have imagined. It's a difficult one because um, at the time, and, and, and we've spoken about this in the past, that we've likened the whole experience to, to climbing a mountain range. At that point, you know, uh, the journey of the business was, was one of a, a design, um, a design and build um, journey, which we'd done several times previously in, in previous lives. Um, and only at the point when someone said, I'm interested in buying one, did it suddenly become a retail business. And then we then had to think about making more of them uh, and building a business and building an infrastructure and people. And so it's a different kind of mountain with a different environment and a different landscape, of course. Uh, I remember when we were having the conversations about the tooling for the bodywork, um, that it might last for 100 cars. And we were looking at ourselves and saying, well, God, you know, if we make 100 cars, then another set of tooling just isn't going to be a, a concern because we're going to be, you know, going to be doing really well. And so, um, you know, 125 cars in and 44 export markets on, then, then of course, we, we, we never expected it to, to be as, as successful. But there was always a belief. And I think the fundamental issue is, is that we, we were designing a car for ourselves um, at that point. And we always used to say, there's got to be more people that are like us with deeper pockets, obviously. Um, you know, we used to go to events uh, like Le Mans every year, um, and there's hundreds of thousands of people there who love cars. They go in their nice cars. They go to events. They hang out with like-minded individuals. Um, you know, we believed that there were people out there who had a focus on driving, uh, on, on owning something. But because it's a new product and, 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 and a new product is a new journey where you've got to shine a, a pretty big t pretty big light down a, down a rabbit hole to show people that, listen, there's a different way of, of, of viewing driving. And as the world evolves, um, and having the right tool for the right job of how you communicate that. Um, and what's absolutely clear is that, the, you know, the more and more people have got to know about the product, there's more and more people who think like us and, and who want that particular tool, albeit it's a very small niche. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's certainly when we pull the cover off the car, we, I don't think we ever expected that we'd be in this position where we are, where, where we are today. Um, and that's what's so great about the journey is, is uh, a lot of people ask us, you know, did you have a business plan and did you sit down and did you, you know, did you think it to death? And sometimes that, that restricts you too much. And sometimes you've got to go with your gut instinct. Of course, we had ideas. We've done our research. We've done a certain amount of, of work in the background. Um, and there were, there were many other cars out there that, that were paving the way at this point 
to our car. So, for example, Ian mentioned the KTM Crossbow. Um, obviously, there's, there's, there's cars like the Ariel Atom. And if you look at, you know, you go back to the 1950s and, you know, Colin Chapman and the Lotus 7, it was a car that was designed all about performance and lightweight that you could drive to the racetrack. You could enter into a, a club sports uh, race uh, category and you could drive the car home. And it was kind of the development of that ethos, but on a level with the kind of RS Porsche brands that, 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 that exist where there's a focus on uh, on um, quality of engineering, design, performance, um, but with this focus on, on, on ultra high performance. And we knew that the car would appeal to those kind of people. So luckily, you know, the world had already started to wake up to, to the right tool for the right job. And we were just taking it, you know, several steps further in every, in every step of the word, really. Where were you in the hall? Were you the first thing people saw? Were you tucked in the back as you were the brand new guys? Whereabouts were you? Well, uh, amazingly, I'm, um, Ian's partner, Yasna, is uh, probably the Miss, Miss Socialite of Stuttgart. And she knew the, the exhibition people extremely well. And I don't quite know if it was, it was her or Ian or, or quite how, but we were right at the front, the main entrance where you walk in. Um, in amongst um, some concept cars from Maybach and Mercedes and AMG. Um, and it really set the tone for us, actually. I think it, it, it really helped uh, to be in that space. Um, and because the car is so beautifully made and, and, and handcrafted and, and has this, this, um, you know, this, this quality about it, it just sat perfectly in this space that they'd called Future Classics. Um, and here we are 10 years on and the car absolutely is a classic. I mean, Jeremy Clarkson has described it as, as one of the most iconic shapes he's ever seen. Um, and despite the fact we've made 125 cars, um, and of course now we're making the new Mono R, um, I still look, we still look at the shape of the car and I still get excited about it today. It's not as if it, you know, it's really stood the test, the, the, the test of time. Um, so it absolutely was a future classic and, uh, you know, certainly, if you look at residual values of the, the first cars we ever made, uh, you know, they're starting to go up in value now. Um, so, um, yeah, no, it was a great, great event, great event for us. So you've, you've launched the BAC Mono. As many people as could possibly love it, love it. How many actual sales actually happened on that day? And how quickly was it? Did it happen in the first hour, in the first 10 minutes? Or, you know, well, obviously after the media, but on the weekend, I guess you had a, a lot of attention financially as well. Well, Neil had actually managed to sell a couple before we even pulled the cover off uh, in, um, at the Oxbow Tower in London. <laughs> I remember him sending me a picture of the check and said, we're in the car business, bro, or something he wrote. Um, then we had a dealer uh, from uh, Poland who'd arranged to come and see the car. Um, I remember the first time someone actually said, yeah, I'd like one. And we all kind of looked at each other like, what do we do now? I mean, we had a design engineering business, you know, we were designers and engineers. Uh, and here we were selling cars on a, on a car show. So um, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if you know it, Neil, but uh, I don't think there was a definite number where you can say they're sold. I mean, there was people who'd said, I'd like to come and see your factory or dealers who'd, who'd said, yeah, let's, let, let's talk about how we can do something. Um, but um, an, an actual number of signed contracts, I, I don't know the answer. I think without without fueling the uh, the PR and marketing um, budget for next year, um, I think I think the the great thing was is that it was a, it was a successful event. It put us on the map. Uh, it was a week before Geneva, and we kind of thought it'd be a soft launch, and that all the world's journalists would be at the Geneva Car Show. But the the, the reach that we got um, straight after it, my uh, my my brother in law um, got married. Uh, at the weekend so I had to disappear on the Saturday so I was there on the Wednesday Thursday and the Friday and I remember my phone was just going absolutely bonkers and um, the the info at email address that we'd set up on our first ever website was literally we were just getting hundreds and hundreds of, of messages of admiration uh, congratulations people wanting more information is the car road legal in all these different countries around the world and it was this sudden realization and shock of oh my goodness, you know. Um, first of all, you know, the right messages can do the right job, and they've got I've got real global reach, and there's there's more than just a handful of people that we thought were interested in this car who, who'd paid deposits at that point, uh, and there's a lot of people around the world, and it stressed the importance of an export strategy. Actually, um, you know, 
being English and, and, and being based in the UK, um, you know, we are, we're always looking towards the UK market, of course, but um, the benefit of Ian being in Germany is that he's looking at the German and the European markets, but the vast, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, most of the, the, the biggest markets are outside the UK and Europe. Um, and that's what came across in all these emails. So it's a sudden realisation of we've just climbed one mountain, which is to design, engineer and build this, this entity. And now we've got to create this other business, which is this sales and marketing and manufacturing and, 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 and uh, uh, side to the business, which, which was also equally exciting because it was the opportunity to, to meet like-minded individuals. And that's, that's the great thing with uh, every new customer actually who comes on board. They, uh, we, we learn a bit about them. They learn about us. They come into our inner circle and, you know, in lots of uh, instances, they become, they become new mates. And it's, it's great to be able to, to enjoy a, a mono owners club event or a, a launch or even a factory tour with people who just like talking about cars and who love your product and uh, are as passionate about it as we are. I was already starting to feel nervous by the end of that first day, actually. As, as Neil said, that feeling of, crikey, what's in front of us? There was a sense of uh, that the, the, the mountain to come is bigger than the one we've just climbed. Uh, and I was already starting to, by the end, it was, it was a Thursday night. We opened at two o'clock and uh, it was Thursday night. We were on the stage. Uh, we had the design boss, Dr. Pfeiffer at the time from Mercedes, uh, congratulating us. But I was already starting to feel kind of butterflies in my stomach about what, what was what was coming. Um, I, I had calmed down a bit by the end of the weekend. As Neil said, he'd had to leave a bit earlier. So I kind of closed up shop on the Sunday. And it was a, whew, wow, you know, what a whirlwind. Um, but yeah, it was straight away looking into all the stuff we've got to do now. It, was, it wasn't a running car at the time. It didn't have any electronics inside it. So it was just a show car. Um, so there was all that still to do. There was plenty to do, get it running, get driving it um, and start responding to the, to the demand. So, Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, the immediacy for me was that I got back for a, I got back for a wedding, but I think I'd liken it to that, you know, we're, we're here talking about 10 years celebration and um, the, I'd liken it to any other the different points in time, actually, over the last 10 years that I do look back on with a, a slight amount of regret in the sense that you can never really enjoy... Yes. a specific event um, or a specific thing as much as you would like to in pure isolation because you're constantly thinking about the next week, the next month, the next thing that you're planning, the next thing, you know, the next adventure, the next mountain that you're going to go and climb. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, we, we, we're both, um, you know, huge petrol heads, yet we didn't even look in any one of the seven or eight halls at the event. There was literally our stand, the bathroom, that was it. Uh, you know, and there's, there's halls full of amazing, you know, Porsche 911s and Lancia Stratos's and Group B rally cars and just incredible cars. And, um, you know, we were that exhausted at the weekend. It was, you know, for me, run for a plane, fly off and then get home, do the event and come back and, and carry on next week and, and, uh, and focus. And, uh, but, um, you know, huge sense of pride. I mean, to have, to have your parents there, um, you know, all your friends, your mates uh, who'd supported us, um, you know, uh, people who'd been part of sort of think tanks of within the circle of trust that we'd sort of, you know, spoke about things like the name of the card, you know, the, the, the price point, um, some of its attributes uh, to have them there. And they were hugely, you know, hugely proud of as well. Uh, it was a, was a great moment. And um one that we'll always look back on with a, a huge sense of pride. And, and, you know, the actual show itself is something which, you know, if anyone's never been to it, then um, if life does get back to some form of normality, and if you, if you're any, if you like cars, then it's a, it's a definitely a must see event because it's, it's just fantastic. You mentioned the, uh, the name of the car, the BAC Mono. What was the thought process there besides the obvious? And were there actually any other names you could have called it? I mean, people, I've had people call it the solo accidentally and things like that. So, uh, you know, is there anything else that was in mind at the time? Well, it, it, um, it started, the project started in September and my daughter was born the June before. So for a long time, it was mono Mia. <laughs> um, it was mono back for a while, uh, but then we didn't like the fact that we were encouraging people to use the letters BAC in the way we don't want them to use it and, and say back. Um, I always felt it needed something else that just mono on its own. It felt like it needed to be, you know, it needed to be two, two syllables almost. Um, so that's where the monomia came from. But 
over time, uh, it just got simplified, and that's obviously more in keeping with the product anyway. So it just it just got shortened to to mono, and then began the the <laughs> the uh, discussions and development of the logo, which um, oh, crikey. you know is uh, the the the, the God, the, the amount of iterations that we went through uh, and the attention to detail, um, it was down to sort of single pixels on a screen in, in radii and and, uh, and so on. It was developed with a really good friend of, of, uh, of Ian's and mine uh, called Martin Grothmark, who had a, a very, uh, very successful um, corporate identity business based out of Stuttgart. And... Um, you know, he he was hugely supportive of us, and he said, "We've got to get this right, lads, because um, you know it's it's you know, you're the next Porsche, the next Ferrari." Went, oh my goodness me, you know, and that put even more pressure on us. And then um, you see, it's like any good design, I think, or, or or any good solution. You look at it, and it seems to make perfect sense. But the reality of it is, you can go off in so many incorrect directions. Um, but we created this. We, I mean, I had a little bit of input into it, but. Uh, you know, we 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 created this logo that I now think is is uh, is absolutely timeless. Uh, it really, really is. Um, and then came the next challenge, which was to design the BAC logo um, that goes on all our clothes and on the car ultimately. So uh, you know, all these little uh, all these little challenges in isolation um, are all you know individual challenges, which um, you know are all. All very enjoyable, but also very um, very difficult at the time to get right. But I think I think we've we've mostly done things the right way over the last ten years. We've made a couple of mistakes along the way. Um, uh, Martin has since said he'll never ever design a logo for a friend who is also a designer again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a that was a learning process for all of us. But no, he did a great job, and um, yeah, we're pleased with pleased with how it came out. Okay, I'm looking forward to this now. It's time for our unexpected guest of the oh, episode. God. For every show of the BAC podcast, we're going to bring in one guest who's played a part in the decade of BAC in one way or another, and Ian and Neil have absolutely no idea who it's going to be. Are we ready for our first guest of the series? I'm nervous now all of a sudden. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Don't be. Please welcome your own father, Glenn Briggs. <laughs> ah. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us on the BAC podcast today. I know you're a very busy man and uh, at one with technology all the, all the time, of course. <laughs> Glenn, we're looking back at the, um, the launch of the BAC Mono in Stuttgart back in 2011. What are your memories of that day? Because, of course, you were there. I was there that day, Stuart, and, and it's, it's quite vivid in my mind because it was my birthday as well, uh, fifth, fifth, around the 5th of March. I'm not quite sure exactly the date that we went, but... Uh, so, so, so proud that um, when, when we saw it in the flesh and, and even more proud when the reception that um, was given to it by passers-by and, and some quite, um, you know, serious people as well at the time, including Michael Schumacher's manager. Um, so, yeah, it was a, a, great, a great day. I, I was buzzing, I'll tell you, and Alma was my wife, she's the mum. I think you were the uh, biggest cheerleader of the lot, I think, uh, because I've seen a photo of you, uh, which is you, arms raised and uh, screaming as the uh, cover comes off. You Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I must have been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Chaps, what was it like to have your dad there on the day and, uh, you know, uncover that to the world and, and have him see that reception and your mum, of course? It was a, it was a, it was a good moment. Uh, they'd seen the car, obviously, uh, back in the UK as we'd wheeled it off the stand for the first time, you know, off the stand where we constructed it the very first time it was on its wheels. And I remember, I think it was my dad started a kind of a round of applause, but we were just exhausted and totally burnt out. We couldn't really enjoy it. As Neil said earlier, you look back at these times and you wish you could have enjoyed them more, but you're so under pressure and exhausted that you, that you don't get to. But it was good that under the spotlights of a show, um, as Dad said, all the people. There was Dr. Pfeiffer, the, the design boss of Mercedes at the time, up, up on the stage with me, um, complimenting us on it. He did. He asked the question. Actually, he said, um, "This is something a lot of us um, dream about doing: car designers, car engineers, starting your own company, doing a car like that." He said, "Were you not worried that it wouldn't wouldn't work out?" And I said, "I was more worried of 
becoming an old man and wishing I'd tried it. And that was the first, and it just, it just popped in my head and I hadn't rehearsed that answer or anything. So yeah, no, it was, it was a great moment. And to look down and dad just had a camera at his face the whole time. I mean, he was, he was beaming obviously, but he was going around taking loads of pictures. And so we've got a lot of good pictures from that event actually. Yeah. Thanks for dad. <laughs> it, it was it was nice on on several fronts <clears throat> as ian mentioned uh you know having everyone everyone there and having having your mum and dad who supported you through everything there but um in the nine ten months that, that led up to that um we obviously decided to pick various different suppliers to make some components and as the deadline got closer and closer we were we were running into timing issues and at one stage I think my dad had an Excel spreadsheet with about 36 different CNC machine people based all all over the UK who could make parts uh, in in various different uh, forms and capacity and we had my sister driving to places in crew picking up the the wheel centre uh, for the steering wheel and that was back here and then Guy was sanding that and preparing that for for, for the for the stickers and then there were other parts that were being collected and we had the, all the family tentacles out across Cheshire and the, the Northwest picking up parts. And so it was nice to just stand there with a drink in our suits and not have to do any actions and not have to worry about anything. But of course that only lasts for five minutes until then it's this guy from the press wants to talk to you and this guy's interested in buying a car and so on and so forth. So um but it was it was a great it was a great day. It was a great night as well from from memory. And then the to our great disgust, we came back the following morning. But if you remember, Ian, um, it was a very late night. We were there till three or four in the morning, I think, with all the guests that were there. And uh, we'd paid for some cleaning that the, the the area would get cleaned. And we came in in the morning, feeling a bit worse for wear. And the show was literally about to open, and the uh, the cleaning staff hadn't cleaned the stand, <laughs> so it's the remnants of. Uh, you know, 50, 60 bottles of champagne and glasses that were all just everywhere. And we just quickly had to try and make the place look spick and span before we had to do it all over again. So it feels like that moment was a very long time in the making. Um, Glenn, what were the boys like as kids and how did their obsession with cars begin? Is that directly from you? Are you responsible for all this? Um, probably. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, myself, quite from, a, from an early age in my childhood, my dad, um, the, the boy's granddad, used to love um, motor racing. So he used to take me to Walton Park. And the earliest I can remember, I would have been maybe five or six. So when our boys got to, uh, and you know, they weren't like babies anymore. They were toddlers. Um, it was Ian that I took first to um, into Clock Einog Forest to an RAC rally. Um, and uh, yeah, he was sat on my shoulders there, and the cars were whizzing by. Um, yeah, it's it, um, and then when Neil came along and he got old enough, we used to go to Walton Park. Uh, and, and I'm just thinking that that little bit through that little particular moment. Um, I remember I, I made them a little seat so that we could get to the back of the grandstand at Lodge. And at the back of the grandstand was, was um, the, the handrail to stop you falling off. Uh, I made a seat that would sit on top of this handrail. I would climb over the handrail and stand behind them so they couldn't fall off. And, and the three of us would be there like all day. Do you know what I mean? Watching the cars going through. And, and it's, it's a lovely thought because the two of them, the well, three of us were there together, the two boys. But then... I can't remember when it was, a year or two ago, there were a couple of cars at Alton Park and there were a couple of cars going through Lodge. And my thoughts were from a couple of little boys to a couple of cars going through that same corner. It just made me tingle. Do you, do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, we I, I used to get a season ticket every year. My mum and dad used to buy me a seat. That was me. my uh, my annual Christmas present was a season ticket for Alton. And because the boys were so young, they just came came along. Do you know what I mean? It was a no-brainer. We just went to every meeting. Do you know what I mean? And, and various parts of the circuits and other circuits. Um, so yeah, uh, apologies, but that's <laughs> that's where they get it from. I think. <laughs> What he didn't mention was the handrail had been made in such a way it was a square section, but so people didn't sit on it. They turned it up and made it into a, into a diamond. So instead of it being like this, it was like this. So dad made brackets that went round it that fit onto it so he could fit a seat. But like he said, it had a back. Did it have a backrest? Or was no, it, no. It was just, it was just, 
I stood behind with, with, with my two arms sort right. of around you both, you know. And, yeah. And if it was a big event and Grandad was there as well, they'd be well, scaffolding and we'd build, Dad would build scaffolding and get up above the crowd <laughs> in this in this structure with plastic and everything in case it rained. And, and had a roof on, yeah. 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 Pack lunches. That, that, yeah. Because my nan had always put extra stuff in, you know, yogurts and biscuits and uh, orange flavoured club biscuits um, <laughs> in, in, in my granddad's pack lunch uh, and then something for, for us as well. And my mum would obviously make one as well. So um, it was always the adventure of seeing what you'd got for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think thing for me, it was always the excitement of the cars coming through. Um, you know, um, one of the things that uh, we've picked up on from, from dad is always about preparation and he was great at, you know, making sure the boots were all polished and uh, a couple of weeks before and bags were packed and everything and maps and which way we'd go into circuits or forests that no one else would even think of. So we wouldn't get caught in any traffic and, and all the rest of it trudging over, you know, mountains to get into a corner on the RAC rally that, that no one would be able to get to. So we'd have a great, a great possibility. And then, you know, all that preparation and, um, literally five minutes before you hear the helicopters coming over um, that are going to be filming the rally cars coming through or the cars are coming out the pit lane uh, to, 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 to go on to the starting line. And then there's the, there's the sirens of the, of the two minute warning, the one minute warning, and then 30 seconds and then they're off all the whistles as the cars are coming through the forest. And I think that's what makes motorsport so interesting. Actually, if you look at it as a sport, um, it's not great value for money, really, for the amount of time, the viewing that you get and the excitement. But the excitement that you get is just on a completely different level compared to other other sports and particularly rallying because you stood so close to it. Uh, you're getting showered in mud and it's a lot safer now these these days. But back in the days when we were there, there was there was no one stopping you from going anywhere, really. And you could get you could get as close to the cars as possible in the safest place, obviously. Um, but for me, it was always the excitement of the cars coming through. You'd, you'd, you'd hear them before you could see them, whether it was a thunder of a, a V8 muscle car around Alton Park or a, or a BDA Escort or a Group B rally car. That was always the thing that, that excited me. And then, of course, from there, it was always, you know, why is that car quicker than that one? And that's, that's where the whole kind of uh, uh, heated discussions used to start about why a, a V8 Morgan would be quicker than a Caterham uh, on a rally stage and, and those kind of debates. And I think up at that point, you know, your, your dad's always giving you the answers to anything that you ask. And that's what parents are like, isn't it? You ask them any question, they give you an answer, but there's a limit to, to any man's knowledge. And, and, and those are the kind of questions. I remember stood at um, uh, Hawthorne Bend at, at, at Brands Hatch and seeing Jonathan Palmer in the Zach Speed Formula One car, absolutely on the ragged edge. And he was 12 seconds off the pace of Mansell at the front. And I just said to my dad, why is he, why is he slower? And he just said, I don't know, you know, and, 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 and that's what, that's why I wanted to understand the mechanics behind suspension and aerodynamics and, and why one thing was faster than another. And that's what, that's what fueled, you know, I think that the start of our, uh, of our interesting cars of being able to, to link your passion with your interests, then it's no longer a job. You know, many people, uh, unfortunately, don't 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 particularly like their jobs. It's a means to an end. But we're very fortunate that we we make our job our our job is our interest and our passion, which is you know very fortunate. Just going back to what Neil said, uh, you're right about that siren, Dad. Do you know what it sounds like now? Has it always sounded that way? My in my memory, it sounds like that siren when a car comes into the pit lane. It's yes. always been that sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, 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 it's almost like an air raid siren, yeah, but, yeah. but it isn't. It, it's like a car horn that's, yeah. that, that's mounted, obviously, on a roof of a building or something. But I'd kind of forgot that until Neil mentioned it. That was all. That was kind of very much reminiscent, and, and the cars are lined up on the grid, and someone's had a problem on the outlap, so he's gone into the pits, and that siren, yeah. that yeah. siren yeah. Um, uh, noise. But um, I, I remember, you know, you'd, you'd have a grid of cars and you'd have a, an Aston Martin and an E-Type would be up at the front and right at the back, there's a little frog-eyed Sprite. And you had this kind of hierarchy of performance all the way through the field. But there was always like a really well-driven Elan that shouldn't really be on the second row, but he was and he was dead yeah. good. And it was like David and Goliath. And I was always, I think we all were actually, we were always for this, this little lightweight car and he'd be in the wind, uh, you know, in the slipstream down the straights and then he'd, get out and outbreak the big cars and then they'd pass him down the next straight. And 
that, that's where I kind of fell in love with, with lightweight cars, you know, formula cars, and then just lightweight sports cars. It, 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 it always, always interested me, probably with that David and Goliath aspect, but also that idea of efficiency and what, being well-driven. But Glenn, you've played, you've played quite a major part in lots of things that the boys have done at BAC, and you're still doing things uh, for the business right now. Well, yeah, you're right, Stuart. I've had to drag myself away to do to do this, actually. But, uh, yeah, it's going OK. Yeah, it's... Um, I'm I'm never one for sitting down and and doing nothing. I can't I can't do that. Um, I've got my jobs all lined up for this afternoon. What I'm going to do, um, but yeah, yeah, it, it's um, it's probably stems from my granddad who who worked till he, he, he when when he got to 65, he he used to tell lies about his age. He would would not be 66. He'd be 64 the following year. And then 63. And, and to be fair, he carried it well. So he didn't retire from ICI till he was 76, right? Um, it, he, and then he went working for somebody else, somebody else, and he got remarried at 89. Do you know Crazy. Um, anyway, um, and, and maybe that's rubbed off on, um, rubbed off on me. Uh, I just think the more I keep going, the more I can keep, the longer I can keep going for, you know, hopefully. So, um, so yeah, um, yeah, and long may it continue. Yeah, we're doing some work in BA City in the factory at the moment in both units, uh, and it's looking good. And it, it all helps to the, um, the the customer perception and, and and the general raising of the standards in the building and makes it makes it look good. And uh, yeah, I'm enjoying doing it. For those uh, for those watching on our YouTube channel right now, I must say that Glenn is. How old are you now, sir? Uh, I'm 73 on Friday. 73 and looks unbelievable. In fact, they uh, didn't believe he was his age when he went for his COVID vaccine. They thought he was an imposter. I'm just trying to get one. So he's doing very well. <laughs> one of my first girlfriends, when, when her father dropped me off at home, my dad was cutting the grass and he said, I thought you said your brother was younger. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very good. Do you remember that, Dad? Alison's, Alison's dad. But, uh, yeah. but to be honest, it's not just now he's retired that he's kind of just wants to stay busy. I have I have no memory of my dad coming home from work and sitting on the sofa and watching telly. He'd come home from work, he'd be in the garage, he'd be around the side, he built his own motorhome, he built almost all the furniture in the house, he extended the house, he was always doing something, you know, teaching himself to weld, uh, teaching himself to mould glass fibre. He was always doing something. And I think that's certainly where I get that, you know, that 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 love of just kind of tinkering and taking stuff apart, making something. I'm, you know, I grew up kind of watching dad do that in the garage and in his workshop around the side later when he built it. So it's not just a thing that's come later in your life, is it? You've always, no, no, always no. been doing something. Yeah. And, and, and a confidence to have a go, I think, is the thing for me. Um, mm. You know, uh, you know, I remember uh, olding bits of... Uh, square section tube in the garage and, and the welding rod getting stuck to him and then that bit would get cut off and we'd have a go you know dad would go again and then he got to be a really good welder actually and it's like it's it's okay to make mistakes have a go have a go at doing things try and learn from them yeah. um and you know nine times out of ten they came out right first time and you know when it came to us starting this business it uh, you know it, it wasn't like we thought about it we did think about the idea of the car for years and years and years but we didn't do a sort of two or three year diligence and go out on an investment and you know like like startups are now there's a, it's all very uh phased in terms of how businesses are, uh, are formed and are ran but but for us it was a we'd always spoken about it we'll never do it unless we do it now it was the world was in financial crisis this was 2007 2008 um and so i think the the have a go and, and it's and it's okay to fail kind of thing was was almost what led to a slight naivety and confidence, maybe overconfidence of of the fact that we'll we'll do this and it'll and it'll succeed. But obviously you can't do that unless the product is absolutely spot on, which which luckily it is. So um, you know things have worked out to date. So long may it continue. Well, thanks for joining us, Glenn. Really appreciate you uh, stopping by and uh, always a pleasure and uh, take care and we'll speak to you soon. <laughs> Okay, then, mate. Cheers, guys. Bye bye. Cheers, bye. Dad. See you later. Yeah. That was a pleasant surprise. I thought I was going to get some old mate from university that uh, might as well be might as well more, be. Than he, more than he should do. <laughs> well, I, thought, I, thought, I thought it was going to be Guy actually, talking about stories about Oz.
that's who I meant. Oh, uh, don't worry. <laughs> oh, right. that, okay. <laughs> that may or may not be lined up. Don't worry. Okay. So, oh, okay. Uh, so after your childhood, you obviously went your separate ways to university. You had Ian studying design and Neil studying engineering. Did you always have this ambition of, you know, coming together and eventually going into business or was it sort of a happy, uh, you know, happy coincidence, if you like? I don't, th- I don't think we, we did. Um, we ended up in the same country. Neil was in Cologne. In fact, Neil was was very instrumental in getting me my first job in Europe. I'd been over in America doing yacht design. Um, Neil was very instrumental in getting me uh, the, f- the first job. And then as we formed our consultancy um, that did design engineering, um, that really grew out of just being offered bigger and bigger projects. I, I, it certainly it didn't, wasn't the, the early goal. I, I'd certainly, I'd always dreamt about having a car company. I'd imagine walking in and people are working and you go upstairs and you're working on the design of the cars and stuff. But I never really thought about who it would be with or how that would really happen. Yeah, same really. Um, I mean, it, it, we, we, we had our kind of pockets of interest um, you know, being an engineer, the, the natural projects that, that I was working on were, were different to body and white and interior projects that, that Ian was working on. Um, I think the Focus RS project for me was a, was a, a soft way of working together because there was lots of ideas that I used to bounce off Ian um, and, 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 and talk about. It was a project that came from nowhere. It was a, a, an idea that, that I evolved with uh, the guys at Ford Racing at the time and, uh, Again, it was a car designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. And okay, we were using Ford Motor Company's monies and deep pockets to go and develop a car, but it was very much a similar process that we went through. Um, once we'd, you know, we'd spoken about different types of cars, uh, we both had, you know, interests in either racing or track days. Um, we both go karted, and uh, Ian was doing track days with with his car. I was winning British championships and racing quite a lot in Europe. And uh, we had nice road cars and there was always this, this, uh, this desire to have this car that, that didn't exist. It was something that, that would be equally at home on the track as it was on the road. Uh, not just in terms of how it drove, but in terms of its appeal and its performance. Um, and um, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't something that we'd that we'd pre-planned almost really. We just kind of spoke about it. And traditionally it was always at Le Mans, you know, which is when everyone all comes together, all your friends and you're all in your own cars and you sort of you know, you 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 reinvigorated with your um, with your ideas and then you go back into your working lives, your busy lives, and you get your head down. It's only when you come back again that you start um, you start thinking about those ideas. And it wasn't until it was a natural break for me um, in some of the projects that we'd been doing. Um, that it seemed like the the right time to to, to give it a go, really. Um, and then, and, uh, luckily, Ian had access to to Murray Adams, who's who's you know seen a designer and our along with Guy, our longest standing employee. And um, I had access to a to a young engineer who I'd been working closely with a, a race car company that I was I was driving for. Um, and he and I worked together, you know, in the UK. And Ian and, and Murray worked together in Germany. And, um, you know, it's, it's crazy now, t- what, 10, 12, 13, 14 years on, um, we're all now familiar with Zoom and, and uh, online meetings. Well, that, that used to take place on a regular basis via Skype, of course. I remember, remember having to load 20 quid onto Skype, you know, credit to be able to have the conversations that we did. And for me, um, I was more on the kind of uh, the less glamorous side of things. So looking at the suppliers and then obviously running the whole finances and making the whole thing work um, in addition to the engineering input that I was putting into. Um, and every Friday, Ian and Murray used to send me over like sketches and bits and bobs that were coming out. It was almost like my kind of uh, uh, emotional energy boost for, for, for the following week uh, to continue. And that's, that's how it was. And that's how it was for, 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 for quite a few of the first years until we, we it was clear that that we started to we needed to make things and then bolt those things together that we'd need a place to do that um, and then that's uh, that's of course when um, Murray Adams decided to come back to the UK because he felt his time in Germany had passed and he wanted to be close to the product to, to, to help with that process and then ultimately that's when Ian started traveling backwards and forwards on a on a weekly basis as well. And that's when we started to, to construct a show car, which obviously was, was launched uh, 10 years ago. So obviously you guys had a, a very successful design engineering uh, consultancy business. What were some of the notable projects from that? Because 
I know you worked for some major, major OEMs, the likes of Bentley, Ford, Porsche. You know, what was the, what were the standout projects that you uh, actually did? I mean, for me as an engineer, um, it doesn't get much better than the, the Focus RS project, um, which was an idea that, that, that came from, from my head, really. Ford, um, Ford was in desperate need of a, a high-performance derivative of the Focus um, car, which had been launched several years previous. Um, I was very influential in that with regards to the, the, the multi, multi-link control blade rear suspension, which was extremely new for Ford at the time and heavily involved in the, the whole vehicle dynamic development and attribute development of that car. And being involved in that process, I was quite mindful and uh, knowledgeable in terms of what the capabilities of the car could be if one was to look at a high performing, a high performance vi- version of the car. Um, Ford had um, lots of... Um, uh, lots of activity that had been, that was ongoing in America, in Europe, uh, in the UK with the touring cars, Formula One engines as well. Um, and so for me, there was a there was a great process that I went through to to meet a lot of the suppliers so that Ford could leverage the use of its suppliers and sponsorship into the product. Um, and it was great that that, that Martin Whitaker and Pascal Luciani at the time, and and of course uh, the late great Martin Martin Leach who was the VP of, of product development for Ford of Europe said, listen, you know, this is a great idea that you've got, um, you know, here's a, here's a small budget, go away, make a running prototype uh, that we can drive and we can assess and let's see, let's see what we can do. And fortunately I knew my way around track seven quite well. Um, after we built the car together, we assembled the, the five major markets within Europe. And I was told to go out and scare them to death around track seven, that they come back with orders for a thousand cars or 500 cars or whatever, that we could build a business case around the car. And ultimately that's what we did. Um, you know, over four and a half thousand units were made down the Saloui production line. Um, the cars are recognized classic. Now it helped to, 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 to reinvent the, the RS brand, which of course has, has since gone on to be the Mark II, the Mark III and Mark IV uh, Focus RS um, you know, it's it's the hot hatch uh, of its era. Um, and it was just a great thing. But I think in terms of BAC, it, it was having that confidence to, you know, as a 30-year-old, to be presenting to board members of Ford Motor Company for, of an idea, um, a polished engineering um, project, a polished, you know, timing plan, project approach, homologation approach, and a business case of what it would do. And we, you know, we spoke about it earlier about having confidence uh, to do things, and that that really did lay the platform, I think, for what we wanted to do at BAC. Because ultimately, when once we were going through the engineering and the design phases, we then had to involve suppliers and to be picking up the phone to the likes of ZF Sachs Racing, AP Racing, OZ Racing, all these various different suppliers who get inundated with requests from from new startups. You know, every day of the week, there was an instant relationship and an instant respect there that meant that we had a real leg up towards towards our end goal, which was making parts and ultimately making the car. I think for me, that was probably the biggest the biggest thing. Uh, for me, really enjoyed the time at Bentley. Um, we did some great work. For me, it was learning a lot about interiors, um, working with, with, with substrates and leather and a lot of handcrafting, which obviously has put us in good stead for, for BAC, but that's a real good overlap with Ian's area on the interest, it gives, gave me a real appreciation actually for what we were trying to achieve and how we could best achieve it. Um, and probably the two biggest ones, ones for me, I guess. What about you, Ian? Sure. I, I, it's funny. It's, um, I mean, our bread and butter was, was the car industry. Um, and most of what we did was for the car industry. Um, as Neil mentioned, uh, most of the work we did for Porsche and Mercedes was seating. Um, and we were involved in a couple of really important seats, certainly for Porsche, um, the carbon seats. We were responsible for carbon, foam, and leather. So it was really only the metal and the plastic parts that, that, that someone else had a responsibility for. Um, and, and they came out great, and we were proud of them. But there were other moments as well. I mean, that, it, that, that consultancy was doing work, industri- industrial design work uh, for all kinds of industries, um, we actually got to do all the product design for Lufthansa First Class for the launch of the 380 when the A380 was first um, uh, first introduced to, to Lufthansa. So, and, and some of the some of the other consultancies that we beat, some very famous um, companies. You know, the, the, just little little um, kind of asides like that were, were, were probably the, the highlights. As I said, the 
the car industry stuff was kind of our was our bread and butter, um, and so that was normal that we were involved in the important and the good projects. So it it was it was some of the other things that, that were around it. Like I say, the Lufthansa first class. We did some good interior design. We had some architects work for us at the time as well. So it was good. We had a good a good cross section of interest in projects, and it was always uh, there was always something new coming along. But we were always burning to do this car. That's for sure. I guess from these projects, I suppose that was how BAC was really born. What was it that made you want to go your own way and, you know, create your own project? Was it sort of just being off the shackles as you like? I mean, as Neil had mentioned, there was a car that we wanted to own, which which didn't exist. So, so there was that. But there was also this sense that we could create a product um, even if it was just a showcase for the for the consultancy business to say, this is what we can do when we decide where the priorities are. Of course, when you work for a customer, uh, you've got, you know, in the case of someone like Porsche, you've got 70 years of history that you have to adhere to and, and what the customer expects from that brand. Um, you've also got, you know, a brand which is producing high volume product. Um, so it's got to have a, a mass appeal. And so we wanted to do something where we said, we'll decide what the where the budget is spent, we'll decide what's important and, and, and you know, we'll create this focused product. And if nothing more comes of it than we build a handful, it'll be a great showcase of what we can do as a business. Um, so I think it was our own desire to own that car, knowing what we wanted it to be. And the fact that, you know, mentally we could kind of justify it from a, it could be a great showcase. It could be a great way of acquiring new, new business um, when we build it. Those two things came together. And so, um, that was that was probably the the moment when we decided to actually go ahead and do it. And like I said, that was probably summer two thousand seven. Must have been because September two thousand seven is when the, when the first designer started work on the research we we, we did. I, th- I think for me, Stuart, the other thing that 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 comes out is um, <clears throat> you know you're your own boss. I mean, that's that, that's the other thing is is that the book stops with you in terms of how much effort you put in. Um, is directly related to what you can get out of it. Um, you know, there's certain instances when you're working for a client where you're, you know, you, you think, I wish, uh, I hope they, 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 they pick solution C because that's the one that we, we really like. You know, you, you, you make two or three different solutions um, and they don't pick it. You think, well, okay, yeah, we did our job. They, they decided to pick something else for their own reasons. That's fair enough. When it's your own business, you know, you're, Masters of your own destiny. You can write your own brief, write your own script, um, and you live and die by your own decisions. And I, you know, I firmly believe all the decisions we've made throughout our history have, have been the right ones at that particular time. It's easy to look back and think, well, we wouldn't, have, we would have done that differently. Um, you know, had had other things been available at the time. But you know, the fact, the reality is that that we've always generally we think made the right decisions. You can always learn from situations and, and hope to do them better. And, in the future sometimes if you're selling design as a service design engineering services um you know you get asked what do you charge per hour how long is it going to take you um all this kind of stuff and, and there was a, there was a sense that we should really be judged on the success of what we deliver rather than how long we spent doing it or what time we were in somebody's office um and i remember saying to neil i said i'd rather we earn money like an author the author goes away he creates a book um, and then if it's a good book, he's a, he's a successful author. And if it's not, then he's not. And that, you know, no one asks, you know, how long did it take to write? Uh, were you, on, were you on, on, on the dining table at home or were you in an office? And did you start at six in the morning or did you start at lunchtime? Nobody, nobody's interested. They just decide, is it a good book? And then Neil turned around and said, yeah. And the great thing is when he's sleeping, someone on the other side of the world is trying to sell that book for him. Um, and those two, those two concepts kind of came together as like, yeah, well, that's another reason to do our own business, isn't it? I mean, we already had our own business, but to do our own product, I should say. So that is episode one of the BAC podcast all wrapped up. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I think I'll be uh, having a beer tonight to celebrate 10 years and hope you guys do the same. Yeah, I think it'd be a gin and tonic in my case. But yeah, that was that was fun. It's, it's fun to... to to, to get dad on um I, as i said i was a bit nervous about who that might be but you don't often have to have the time or you don't get around to reflecting on the past with your parents in that way um and why they did certain things um so so that was good um no i've enjoyed it fun i hope you know someone else can be the judge as to whether <laughs> it was funny or entertaining but um it's been a nice it's been nice having a little chat about that time 
No, I think I think the viewing figures will uh, will say whether it's been uh, an interesting <laughs> an interesting podcast or not. It's uh, I think reflection is a great value to have, um, and it's something which perhaps as individuals and and and, and generally people we. Uh, we don't do enough of there's a, there's a good friend of mine says the past makes you depressed and the future makes you anxious. Um, but I think, you know, being able to look back and be proud about things gives you a strength to, to continue, particularly in this pandemic um, and the times that we find ourselves in. Um, there is a sense now of feeling of having got through the pandemic and Brexit that, you know, life can only get easier moving forward. Um, so it's been great to, to, to share some of these, uh, some of our stories. Hope people have found them interesting there's lots more to come um, and uh, hopefully a few more chuckles to be had. So uh, thanks for listening. Absolutely. been a pleasure, gents. So don't forget to subscribe, share the podcast with your friends, and everything else to spread the word. We've got nine more episodes of looking back at the history of BAC with lots of secrets and stories to share. Follow us on the usual social channels at Discover Mono. There's your chance to ask the boys questions as well. Next week, we're moving on to the reception. And that is discussing the first impact of BAC Mono on the world. And of course, that shoot with Jeremy Clarkson and what really goes on behind the scenes at Top Gear. Hell of a story. Don't miss it. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.